So I've got a whiskey here just to help me with my cold this morning. So just if I begin to squint, just bear with me till the end of the service. You all well? Well, how's that? God speaks through what Gav shares and what Jock had on his heart. So unplanned, but God weaves things together because that's the God that we serve, a miracle working God. And so good to be with everyone this morning. And as I mentioned, Gavin, I must actually say, um, if you were here last week, maybe you weren't, um, Gavin, his wife, Leandra, who leads worship, she led this morning. They've been on a journey for, for months, at least Gavin for months, Leandra for about three years, about just figuring out whether or not they should move overseas. And so eventually after lots of prayer and seeking God, they felt early on in the year that it's, it's time to go. And so they're going to be immigrating. Gav's only got three Sundays left with us. The 14th of August will be his last Sunday with us. He'll be on a plane the 21st of August, and Lee then plans to join them later on in the year, early next year. And so we're going to miss them, honestly. Um, the 14th, we're going to have a bit of a goodbye for Gav, but um, they've sown their lives into this church over years and years and years, the two of them. And so they've been assets to us, and they've really helped build the church uh, physically and spiritually, no jokes. And uh, so, so what we want to do, Scripture says, give honor where honor is due, and we're a church that are generous. What we decided to do as a management board is to actually just bless them on their way out. And so it's pointless. We buy them something practical that they don't need right now, like a new coffee machine. They would appreciate that, but they don't need it. Um, so we thought, let's just, as a church, come together. Let's be generous. I've already given my gift toward them. And uh, just give cash toward them. And so you are more than welcome, invited to give into our normal church account, just with a reference, Gavin or Gavin and Leandra, and then we're going to send that off with them. So we're going to do that, even if it's something small that you have. Um, our collected giving will make a difference and bless them. So, so who had a, a fantastic week at work this week? You're like, Andrew, I was a new man, a new woman. I changed my workplace. Miracles happened. Things changed because I heard one sermon on workers' worship. I thought not, Okay. <laughs> It's a process. We've got to learn more and more. And so last week I covered um, the purpose of work. Today we're going to look at the productivity of work and how God actually calls us to work hard. And so the, the aim of this series was really to recover, or maybe for some of us, to discover a biblical theology of work. That if an average adult person works one third of their life, then surely our work matters to God. That God cares about what we do Monday through to Friday. Last week, we looked at a few scriptures, and the, the, our very first introduction to God and to man, both of them in scripture, is them as worker. God could have introduced himself as all things, but he says, I'm going to introduce myself as worker. He created the, the world in seven days, six days, and rested on the seventh. And so, if God and man are introduced as workers, then our work is not peripheral to true spirituality. Our work, actually, to some degree, is part of our worship to God. Colossians 3.23 said what? Whatever you do, work at it with all your heart. Other translations say work at it willingly as working for the Lord, not for human masters. That can change our work experience. When we go to work every day and say, God, I'm here to work for God and I'm not just working for an earthly boss. And so maybe you ask, well, Andrew, how do I actually worship God at work? Does it mean that at 12 o'clock I've got to go close my door, get on my knees and pray and sing maybe? No. That's our general understanding of worship. But you and I worship God at work through our attitudes. What is our attitude at work? It's through our conduct. It's through how we treat people, talk to them, the staff, our colleagues. It's the decisions we make. It's how we handle money. When we do all of these things God's way, God gets the glory. And he says, thank you for your worship at work. When we honor him in everything at work. Philippians 1.27, this has always been a scripture that's been close to my heart. And it says, whatever happens, or at all times, conduct yourself in a manner worthy of the gospel. That puts a bit of pressure on us as Christians, that wherever we are, God's saying, somebody's watching. And you need to conduct yourself at all times in a manner worthy of the gospel, reminding ourselves that we are ambassadors, representatives of God and His church. And so if people at work look at us, we've got to say, are we good representatives? Or do they know that we don't care about people, we're cheating the system, we, we, we're gossiping about everyone? No, 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 conduct yourself in a manner worthy of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so you and I are called to be different at work. You must be the odd one out as a Christian. <laughs> That's part of your calling. And I, I really am convinced that God calls us to stand head and shoulders above the rest. 
Would you agree with me? That God says in your workplace, as a Christian, as my son, as my daughter, you should stand up. You should be the one making the biggest difference where you are. This week I sat and I thought, well, what would it have been like for Jesus to have gone to work? What would he have been like in the workspace? A few things that came to mind was he would have arrived on time. (coughs) Anyone? He would have arrived on time. He would have left later if necessary, if he had to put in an extra hour or two. He would have cleaned his workstation. Who's with me? Like, you leave your workstation clean, not lying around, okay? He would have put all his tools back. You know, he was a craftsman. Jesus would have used honest scales. He wouldn't have skewed the digits, so he would have profited more. He would have had a client, a a warm client interaction. Imagine going to his shop. He would have got the warmest greeting ever. Jesus, the Son of God. Good morning, how are you? Hey, how do you think Jesus would have greeted you? He was fully God, but fully man. And I think sometimes we downplay that. I think Jesus would have had incredible after-sales service. If, if you had a, a, a fault with what he had made, he would have come back and he would have served you willingly, not going, oh, this one again, here's another repair job. But Jesus, what would he have been like at the workplace? And I think we need to think, am I like Jesus in my workplace? So the challenge for us is to find the balance between building our careers and building what matters most to God. What matters most to God? It's people, and ultimately it's His kingdom and His church. And so many of us sweat building our careers, but then we neglect our faith and building what God is asking us to be a part of. We need, to, we need to find that balance of what's earthly and what's eternal, because what's eternal is forever, and we can't just spend all our energy on the earthly. We need wisdom. So, so I want to suggest three books. This week I was so, so excited um, someone sent me a picture and they said, oh, I bought the book and I started reading it. Three books, God at Work by Ken Costa, Excellence Wins by a German man, I won't mention his name, and then Take the Day Off by Pastor Robert Morris. These three books I've read, I've actually, I'm going to read an excerpt from this book in just a moment. Three brilliant books that will help you understand what it's like to be a Christian in the workplace. And here's a quick reminder before we jump into productivity. Last week we said that, what is the purpose of work? The purpose of work is not just to make a profit for provision, right? Part of our purpose in work is actually to serve people. That's the secret sauce to successful business. Can you offer a solid service? Can you actually deliver on what your clients are paying for? And you and I have the best model of servanthood. Jesus taught us how to lay our lives down in all ways so that others can benefit. And if our businesses are modeled by servanthood, I can assure you that you're going to see the blessing of God on your business. We also said last week that work doesn't just offer us money. Work offers us a level of dignity and purpose. That's why you and I struggle emotionally, mentally, physically, spiritually when we're unemployed. Because work is so vital to our well-being. And so at the end of the service, we're going to pray for those who may be unemployed, in a sticky situation, looking for a new job. We're going to trust for God's blessing. Not only this morning, but throughout the series, we're saying, God, as we speak about work, God, we want you to do immeasurably more in our workspaces. So Lord, we pray for this morning as we jump into your word, just to learn today, Lord. Lord, I pray that we won't just hear information, Lord, but I pray that your spirit would come and touch what we hear that it would become revelation, Lord, that you would open our eyes to the truth of your word and how it applies to us in the workspace. And we all said, amen. So today, productivity, the importance of hard work. Who, who would consider themselves a hard worker? Like you sweated at work. Come, don't be, come, I want to see hands. Don't be ashamed. The others, would you consider yourself lazy? Okay. But, you know, God expects you and I to work hard. And do you know this? Maybe this is going to burst your bubble. Your primary goal at work is not to be an evangelist. Your goal as a Christian is not to be an evangelist at work. What does your boss pay you to do? Evangelize or work? To work, okay? So we must be wise that we don't go there. Maybe you work with that person. They let you know that they're a Christian. And they're like, speak Christianese. All they do is the Christianese and they fail in their work. Is that a good model for us? Is that a good representation? No ways. So we've got to go to work saying, I get paid to 
deliver the goods. I've got to get paid to actually do what I'm employed to do. Now, we need the wisdom of the Spirit to actually see, well, maybe God does give us opportunities here and there with people, and we've got to minister to them and evangelize where we can. But the primary goal of our work is not just to work, but to work hard. So scriptures, Scripture gives us God's design for work. Okay, God created a seven-day week for us. God created the earth in six days, and he said, you've got to rest one of them. So that's God's design. We know that that is the Sabbath, and I'm going to mention more about that. So, so God says, work six days, rest one. Most of us only work five. Isn't that true? And we get to rest two, sometimes even more. And, and there's right now, there's a debate whether as we should be having a four-day work week. Who's up for that? Okay, one, two, three. So some of you are like, that will work for me. Now, now I'm not saying a four-day work week is wrong or right, but I think we should at least ask, well, is it motivated by a desire to work hard or is it a, is a, is it a desire for the soft life? Like, I want to work four days so I can chill more and more. Is it according to God's design or not? And so we can be guaranteed that, that God values hard work and he even rewards hard work because if you study the scriptures, you see how opposed God is to laziness. And I thought, let's look at some of those scriptures so you can grab God's heart for how he opposes laziness. Proverbs 14, I would encourage, go and read all of Proverbs. Read a proverb a day. There's 31, so it gives you one every day to read in a month. But it speaks so much about the fool, the wise person, the hard worker, the laborer, the lazy person, the sluggard, the sloth, all these things. Go read it for yourself. But Proverbs 14 says all, okay, all, didn't just say work, all hard work brings what? Brings a profit, that's obvious, but mere talk leads only to poverty. Now, now I'm going to compare it to gardening. I enjoy gardening, and I know that there's a reward that comes when I sweat in the garden, when I really like mow and I pull out the weeds and I'm cutting and I'm, I'm broken, I'm finished, but at the end of it, I look at that garden and I go, oh, that's my profit, that's my reward for my hard work. And in the workspace, it's no different. When you and I truly sweat it, when we really not just work, but work hard, God is going to bring a reward to us, but mere talk leads only to poverty. Who knows a talker? They talk and talk, but they don't get things done, and they're the ones who sit with no profit. 2 Thessalonians 3, 6 to 15. Listen to this. This is some strong language. Paul writes to the church, and he says this is to the church. He says, a warning against idleness. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, we command you, brothers and sisters, to keep away from every believer who is idle. Anyone know a lazy Christian? Just say, Scripture says, I can't associate with you. <laughs> Imagine, no, 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 you're lazy. I, I can't associate with you. And who is idle and disruptive and does not live according to the teaching you receive from us. For you yourselves know how you ought to follow our example. We were not idle when we were with you, nor did we eat anyone's food without paying for it. On the contrary, we worked night and day, laboring and toiling so that we should not be a burden to any of you. We did this not because we do not have the right to such help, but in order to offer ourselves as a model for you to imitate. So he says, we are entitled to your gifts. Your, the money that you give us as apostles, they had that right. They could have, but they said, we didn't take it because we wanted to teach you what it's like to work. He says, we, we can, we're entitled, but we're going to say no. We're going to be an example to you. For even when we were with you, you gave, we gave you this rule. The one who is unwilling to work shall not eat. That's what the Bible says. We hear that some among you are idle and disruptive. They are not busy. They are busy bodies. Such people we command and urge in the Lord Jesus Christ to settle down and earn the food they eat. And as for you, brothers and sisters, never tire of doing what is good. Take special note of anyone who does not obey our instruction in this letter. Do not associate with them in order that they may feel ashamed. Yet do not regard them as an enemy, but warn them as you would a fellow believer. Listen, do we think like this as Christians? Do we see the level that God puts on the church? He says, as, listen, as my sons and daughters, I've called you to so much greater. And, and, and I need you to shine out. And the, and the bar is high. And I know it's difficult to follow God, to be a disciple, but it's not impossible. What God calls us to is actually achievable. And this is, when I read things like this, I'm like, wow, I've really got to change the way I work. 1 Timothy 5 and 8, listen to this. Anyone who does not provide for their relatives, and especially for their own household, has denied the faith and is worse than an unbeliever. 
<laughs> okay? That is strong language. Now, I didn't get up today so I could scare you. I'm just saying, let's recover a biblical theology of work and how God values our work, that our work is not peripheral to true spirituality. And this is the kind of value and weight that God puts on our work and our efforts to actually provide for our families. So God wants us to work hard. He wants us to produce the goods, bring the fruit. But who knows that God also wants us to balance that with equal rest and replenishment. God doesn't want us to just slave away and suffer. He's like, no, you need to work hard, but then you also need sufficient rest and replenishment. And you know that burnout is not a badge of honor? So many people today praise it. I was speaking to someone this week. He says he puts in all the midnight hours. He takes his computer home after work and he just works and he works and he works. And he says the staff eventually told him, dude, just leave your computer at home. Because so many times you and I think, you know, the harder I work, the more honorable it is. Maybe it's not as commendable as what we think, as what we think is praiseworthy. God looks and says, man, that's stupidity. What are you doing? Work hard, but rest hard as well. I'm going to read this and then I want us to repeat it together. I am more important than what I do because what I do is maintained by how I am. Let's read it together. I am more important than what I do because what I do is maintained by how I am. You are more important than what you do. And don't allow what you do to get the better of you. Okay? You, you, you've got to find that balance for you. Because work, listen, work doesn't define us. You and I do not exist to work. We are called to work, but we exist to worship. And we need the Holy Spirit's help to figure out, am I actually working too hard? Or am I not? Matthew 16, verse 26. If we think about burnout as a badge of honor and people just striving to do so much, what's, what would Scripture say to that? Jesus said, Matthew 16, 26, what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world yet forfeits his soul? Jesus is saying to us, what's the point? You earn all the money, you get the accolades, you buy the house you've dreamed of, you buy all the cars, etc. Let's just swing it to an extreme. You get all the wardrobe, all that you want, yet you don't have family, you don't have friends, and you don't have friendship with God. He says, what's it actually worth? Th that, that would encourage us to step back and think, sure, am I just pursuing the things of this world or am I pursuing what matters most to God? People, family, friendships, faith, because that stuff is also important. Ecclesiastes 4 and 6, better to have one handful with quietness than two handfuls with hard work and chasing the wind. Which one are you going to take? One hand with quietness, like... I could work more, I could earn more money, but I'm rather just going to have one handful with quietness and peace instead of trying to fill both hands and just living a life of chaos. Ecclesiastes, go and read that book as well. It speaks so much into the area of, of work as well. And it says, whoever loves wealth never has enough. Where, where's, the, where's, the, where's the line? How much am I going to push? And when's enough actually enough? Another verse, I think it's in Psalms, it says, don't wear yourself out trying to get rich. Listen, in a modern day age, that is the, the natural push you and I have. Go out and make as much as you can. And scripture says, have wisdom to know when enough is enough. So if God rested, who are you and I to think that we don't need to rest? If he rested, then surely we need to rest as well. Genesis 2 and 2, by, by the seventh day, God had finished the work he had been doing. So on the seventh day, he, he rested. He rested from all his work. Many of us sitting in this room grew up in the time when the shops were closed on Sunday. Hey, Nils, William, come on. Even my, I'm only 38. You could not get what you wanted at the shop because it was closed. There were like a few, I think the Greeks cheated. They, they were open to like 12 o'clock on a Sunday. You could quickly go get your bread or your milk. But otherwise, nothing. You had to plan because everyone, believers, non-believers, took advantage of the Sabbath principle and rested. Look, if you go to malls today, Joburg across the country, I can't imagine overseas, those malls are staying open into Sunday evening and they, they, they're running 24-7. When are people getting a rest? Yes, we know there's shifts, but still, we're working too hard, I think. In 2017, I got to go to Israel. We were walking through the streets of Jerusalem, 
And I walk past this bottle store and I've got a picture to show you. And as I saw it, I just laughed. We see signs everywhere that say 24-7, right? Well, I looked at this bottle store and it said 24-6. <laughs> and I'm like, well, there's Israel for you. Why? You will not find a Jew who's going to cheat on the Sabbath. And it was so interesting for us. We got to go to the Western Wall and actually experience a Sabbath. And so their Sabbath starts on a Friday night at 6 o'clock and it ends on Saturday night at 6 o'clock, which makes Sunday the first day of their work week, right? So it was a bit of a calendar adjustment for us to, to figure that out, that Sunday is the first day of the week. For us, it feels like it's the last day. But, but even in the hotel room that we stayed in, the elevators are automated between Sabbath. You can't push a button to say, I'm going to the second floor. It just goes to each floor because they would consider pushing a button as effort and work. That's how strict they are. You go study the Old Testament. Look at the book of Numbers when God gave the nation of Israel and God was extreme with them because he wanted to separate them from all nations. And he gave them the principle of the Sabbath so that they would rest. There was a death sentence associated with the Sabbath. So on the Sabbath one day, they find a man. He's collecting sticks. He's gathering sticks for his fire. He wants to go make lunch for his family. They find the guy. They take him to Moses. They say, Moses, what must we do with him? Moses seeks the Lord. The Lord says, you've got to kill him. Imagine your boss said to you, if you come to work on Sunday, I'm going to kill you. <laughs> we go, thank you. I'm not going to come to work. So we don't have those pressures anymore. But we've got to say, well, I've got to learn from that, 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 that resting is very important, as much as what working hard is also important. Now, now, the key for us is that today you and I don't become legalistic with the Sabbath. Please, as Christians, we're not going to find, are we meeting on the wrong day of the week? Is God happy with us meeting on a Sunday? Shouldn't it be the Saturday? And, and we get all these things. That, and can I do any work on a Sunday? Can I only rest on a Sunday? Can I take a Tuesday off as well? When must I rest if I work these weird hours? The point is not to be legalistic. Listen to this lady by the name of Missy Takano, she said, as followers of Jesus, God does not expect us to live by Israel's laws. However, the wisdom of these laws remains. And the law of the Sabbath is rich with significance for us today. Listen to what she said. Sabbath is not a commandment we are bound to. It's a promise we're invited to enjoy. Don't be legalistic. Don't be about the law. Jesus came and he did away with the law. He fulfilled the law with grace. We're under grace now, okay? So it doesn't mean we kick Sabbath out. We don't kick tithing out. It's no, we look at it differently now. You're not going to get stoned by your pastor if you work on a Sunday, okay? Anyone ever seen that? Never. Why? Because God is gracious and he works differently. But we've got to look and say, well, what's the principle of rest right there? The point is that we rest, not when we rest. Jesus, many times, he encountered the religious people, and believe it or not, Jesus didn't like the religious people. The Pharisees, the Sadducees, they got in his hair. They gave him headache all the time. Go read the scriptures. He didn't like them. He, he, they upset him. And, and he would go with his disciples, and the disciples would pick grain on the Sabbath. And they said, oh, look at your disciples. They're working. They're picking grain on a, on a Sabbath. What are you going to do? And then he said to them what? He said, the Sabbath is made for man not man for the Sabbath. The Sabbath exists for us. We don't exist for it. So again, the lesson is not to become legalistic. It's to learn by grace how we should rest better. But the Sabbath is more about trusting than resting. If, if you go and break it down, what is the Sabbath actually about? What is rest all about? Is it truly just about the rest? No, it's about the trust factor. That do you and I believe that God would provide when we do nothing. That if that's God's design, we always say it, if you want to get God's results, you've got to do it God's way. Now, now, can you and I actually believe that if we go hands off and say, I'm not going to work for a good 24 hours, at least once a week is a good guideline, then, then I'm going to believe that God's going to provide even when I do nothing. And I know the wrestle, like, most Mondays I, I take off and I distance myself from my computer, phone calls, people will call. I purposefully put it down because like I don't want to engage. I need to disengage so that I don't just work around the clock. And I know it's so tempting. I'm like, I'm expecting this email. I wonder if it came. Let me go check. And I'm like, no, 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 leave it. Because I'm trying to discipline myself more and more just to say, Andrew, you need rest. 
Robert Morris in his book, Take the Day Off, says, rest, speaking on rest, he said, rest, he said, it's like tithing. People who tithe know that 90% with God's blessing will go further than 100% without it. People who rest one day a week know they can get more done in six days with God's blessing than seven days without. See, it's not a rest issue. It's actually a trust issue. Tithing is a trust issue. It's not a money issue. Will I trust God that as I give him, as I give him my time, as I honor him with my resources, that somehow significantly, divinely, he touches it, blesses it, makes it go even further. I want to read to you a story from his book. There's a, an American food chain called Chick-fil-A. It's like our chicken KFC kind of thing. But he, he mentions their story. Listen here. He says, the Chick-fil-A restaurant chain defines all fast food industry conventional wisdom by closing their stores on Sunday. Closing on Sunday, the day when many families eat out, is unthinkable for most food chains. In fact, to maximize purse store sales, many are, are staying open 24 hours a day. We've got it here in our little conservative Renegan town. Founded by a Christian family headed by a born-again believer, the late S. Truett Cathy, Chick-fil-A, has stubbornly refused to open their stores on Sunday. Here's how Chick-fil-A explains that decision on the company's website. Our founder, Truett Cathy, made the decision to close on Sundays in 1946 when he opened his first restaurant in Hapeville, Georgia. Having worked seven days a week in restaurants open 24 hours, Truett saw the importance of closing on Sundays so that he and his employees could set aside one day to rest and worship if they chose, a practice we uphold today. In spite of what the restaurant industry views as a disadvantage, the company's growth and success continue to stun the business world. A 2017 article on the popular business website, Business Insider, put it this way, Chick-fil-A is dominating fast food. The company generates more revenue per restaurant than any other fast food chain in the US, and it's only open six days a week. Chick-fil-A has only, listen here, Chick-fil-A has only 2,100 restaurants and none of its restaurants are open on Sundays. For comparison, McDonald's has more than 14,100 locations in the US. Taco Bell has nearly 6,300 and KFC more than 4,160, most of which are open seven days a week. Yet, Chick-fil-A generates more annual revenue, revenue than dozens of other chains that have more than twice as many U.S. locations, including KFC, Pizza Hut, Domino's, and Arby's. And he goes on to say what they actually make in a year, just because they understand the principle of rest. Now, let me say this again, and then we're going to say it together. I am more important than what I do, because what I do is maintained by how I am. Okay, let's say it together. I am more important than what I do, because what I do is maintained by how I am. So the challenge is there. God wants you to work hard. He wants you to sweat. But God also wants you to balance that with good, healthy rest. Because the one is going to feed the other. If you and I work seven days a week, we're going to be exhausted. If we rest too much, we're just going to become lazy and we're not going to be motivated to work. So we need to look at God's design. And we need to say, God, I need wisdom. And God, I also need faith to rest. Faith is a rest thing. Remember, it's a trust issue. It's not a resting issue. God, I need faith. God, I need wisdom so that I don't swing to an extreme and become a workaholic or that I don't swing the other way and become a lazy bones. Psalm 127 verse 2. It is useless. It is useless to get up early and stay up late in order to earn a living. That's a challenge for many in the room right now. It is useless to get up early and stay up late in order to earn a living. God takes care of his own even while they sleep. See, many of us live our work life thinking, I'm going to work so hard to impress God. And the harder I work, the more I'm going to have. And God says, uh, not exactly. I'm going to give you what you need. Don't wear yourself out trying to get rich. Because listen, son, daughter, I provide for you even while you sleep, when you're doing nothing. Listen, this is liberating for so many of us. We can step back in our workplace and say, man, I've been sweating too hard for nothing. What I need to trust for is for God's order, God's design. And see God's blessing when I do things his way. Wisdom and faith is also going to help you and I not to 
forget to enjoy life. If you go read the book of Ecclesiastes, Solomon, who accumulated more wealth and anything that any of us could ever imagine, horses and chariots and castles and aqueducts and forests and orchids, he, he, had, it, he had it all. Solomon lived the life. And, and guess what he wrote to us today? Listen to what he said, Ecclesiastes 8. So I recommend having fun. Amen. We can end it right there. After, uh, a man who had it all says, you know what I recommend? Have fun. Because there is nothing better for people in this world than to eat, drink, and enjoy life. That way, they will experience some happiness along with all the hard work God gives them under the sun. Enjoy life. How many of us live our lives and all work does is rob us of our attention and we give it too much attention. We need to step back and say, listen, I'm going to work. I'm going to work hard, but I'm not going to let work rob me of my joy, rob me of my purpose. What is my purpose? My purpose is not to work. I'm called to work, but I don't exist to work. I exist to worship and, and enjoying life with friends and family and pursuing faith and things in God is as important as our work. So the encouragement for us is to, to go for gold at work. Go for gold. Whatever your hand finds to do, do it with all your might, okay? Get the accolades. Go for it. Do more than what's expected. Honor everyone. Be generous. Find solutions. Don't wait for instructions. Don't gossip. Be honest. But listen here, make sure that you win in other areas of life too. That maybe at work your colleagues praise you. Whew, you work hard and you do all these things and you've won these awards, but you go home and you're a loser. Your wife says you're never at home. Your kids say, where's dad? I don't know. You go to the church, you're like, I, I just don't have friendship with God because I'm just so busy. Let's win at work, but let's win at home, but let's work in the, win in the area of faith as well. And so, so we need good rest to feed our hard work so that we can worship God both in our rest, but also in our hard work. Does this help? Come, let's pray. And I, I know, I know the Holy Spirit's prompted you. He said something to you. Many of you might be sitting here thinking, man, I'm so guilty of working so hard. Listen, God's gracious. He's saying, well, I want to show you a different way. We serve a God of rest. You know, Jesus invites us. We find a beautiful passage of scripture. Jesus says, come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. He's saying, all of you burned out on religion tired of religiosity and tradition, he says, come to me, I'm going to show you grace. And what I'm going to give you is rest for your souls. And as much as what we need rest for our souls, God calls us to rest in our bodies as well. And you know, Jesus, when he taught of the Sabbath and God's design for the Sabbath, it was actually always pointed to something so much greater than just having one day off in a week. When you go and research and, and when we understand what the Sabbath re really means, Jesus says, I am your Sabbath. It's in me that you find rest. Not in not working for 24 hours. It's when you give your soul to me. That's when you find rest. I am your Sabbath. And maybe for some of you today, you say, I need to give my soul to Jesus. I need to pursue him with all I've got. I need to trust him. I need to believe in what he did on the cross, that it's sufficient and that it transforms my life. And I need more of his Holy Spirit because it's in him that we find rest for our souls. Scripture says, taste and see that the Lord is good. When our souls have tasted Jesus, we realize we don't need anything else. He's enough. He's what we've been looking for all our lives. He's loving, he's forgiving, he's kind, he's compassionate, he's merciful. He removes our sins as far as where the east is from the west. We can find salvation in Jesus. He's paid the hard work of our salvation on the cross. It simply requires a response. We've got to believe in him. And as I mentioned earlier, I said, you know, today we want to pray. For those of you who are in sticky situations, where work conditions are not ideal, where you're frustrated, where work feels like a duty, not a delight, Maybe you're trying to get out. Maybe you've been sending CV after CV after CV after CV. But we want to pray for you. We want to trust that God can do immeasurably more than what we can ever ask or imagine. So if that's you, why don't you stand to your feet?
We're going to commit your situation to God. We want to see your work situation turn. We want to see God favor you in that space. Come on, if that's you, stand to your feet. Well, church, we're going to pray for Portia this morning. Portia standing alone. And we're going to trust with her that God's going to open doors that no man can close. That God's going to give her, by the Spirit of God, wisdom and clarity. You know, we need to be unashamed in asking God for work. Because we know that God values our work so much, we don't have to be shy in saying, God, help me find a job. God wants us to work, and He'll make a way for us. So, Lord, we want to lift Portia to you this morning, God. Lord, for her and her family, for where they're at, the situation, Lord, we don't have all the details, God. But thank you that you're a God that sees. You're a God that knows all things, Lord. You know the situation. You know the stickiness, Lord. You know where there's the closed doors, the open doors, the good people, the difficult people, the times of lack, times of plenty. And Lord, I pray for them that they would just continue, strengthen them in the inner being, Lord. As you take them through the season, Lord, may they never doubt that you are not good. For Lord, you are good and what you do is good. And so Lord, favor them. Favor Portia in her pursuit for work, Lord. May you do immeasurably more than what she could ever ask or imagine, we pray. In Jesus' name. And we said, Amen. What a great message. Um, and I just want to reiterate what Andrew said, where he said, you know, God will, speaking of offering, God will bless you. You can do more with your 90% than when 100% without God. And I think when it comes to rest, God can do more when we take a day of rest in our six days or our five days and with God or seven days without God. And, um, you know, it just made me think of the scripture. I think it's in Matthew 26 where it says, look at the birds. Um, they do not go hungry. Look at the lilies. They do not clothe themselves. Yet God provides for them. God closes, clothes the lilies. And I think that's a scripture for every single one of us that, you know, whatever we do, do it all for the glory of God, but at the same time, let's take a day of rest and just live a good, balanced life. Let's look at James 2, verse 17 and 21 to 22, which says, Thus also, faith by itself, it does not, if it does not have works, is dead. But someone will say, You have faith and I have works. Show me your faith without your works, and I will show you my faith by my works. You believe that there is one God, you do well, even the demons believe and tremble. But you do what you want to do, O foolish man, that faith without works is dead. So, if we look at James 2 verse 17, thus by faith itself, it does not have works, it's dead. Also down in 22, 21 to 22, we see, was it not Abraham our father justified by works when he offered Isaac his son on the altar? Do you see that faith was working together with his works, and by works faith was made perfect? But be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourself. So in Hebrews 11 verse 4, we see another example of faith put into action. By faith, Abel offered to God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain. And through this sacrifice, he obtained witness that he was righteous. God testifying, they are testifying of his rights. So we see that there are two perfect examples of faith being put into action by offering gifts to God. Abram, by putting his faith in action, offered his son Isaac. And Abel, by faith, offered an excellent gift to God. So today as you give, know that you are putting your faith into action and faith pleases God. So if we can just pray together. Lord, today we bring our offering to you as an act of faith. We put our faith into action and we believe that your honor and that you will honor it and pour out blessing in our lives. Thank you, Lord, for the privilege that we have to be able to invest in your church and in your kingdom. Amen. So may the seeds that we sow be fruitful and make our harvest immeasurably, immeasurably more. So you can see on the screen there's many ways to give. So please do visit the giving station afterwards and make sure that we activate our faith by giving. Thank you.